Uh, so much for these kids. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if y'all can follow Samson this way for the kids' time. And as usual this morning, if you need translation into uh, Russian, you can come see uh, Ala over there, and uh, we'll get you set up. Well, speaking of of children, uh, one of the joys of of getting to be a parent is getting to stop and break up, you know, multiple fights uh, per day between the, the, the kids. So it doesn't matter if the room is full of thousands of toys, right? Two kids always want the same toy. This is part of being a child, you know? We want what we want when we want it. Actually, adults aren't so different, different either, right, now that I think about it. But, you know, when a couple of my kids are fighting and arguing, my wife and I, you know, we try to stop it. And if it's clear that one of the kids is wrong, then as a step of discipline and training, uh, we tell that child to apologize to the other child. And you can imagine how that goes. Usually the child just says, sorry, uh, as quick as they can, with no feeling in it, uh, no rep- not much repentance in the apology. They're just trying to tick the box so they can get back to playing with their toys again. Sometimes we'll try to correct them and say, no, you have to say it with more feeling. You have to say it as if you mean it. Uh, but if we are tired, we'll just say, fine, you know, the sorry was, was good enough. So what's wrong with just saying sorry? I mean, they are asking, they are doing what we are asking them to do. Well, the problem is, is that there isn't much genuine repentance in it. They're doing the external step But the external step doesn't have much meaning without the internal repentance. In other words, they're doing everything fine on the outside, but the inside hasn't changed. Well, this morning I want to talk about that difference, the outside versus the inside. And this morning we're going to look at a, a lot of instructions regarding the outside. But the real question is, What is going on inside of you? Are you telling God, sorry, when you sin? Or are you moved to real, genuine repentance and a desire to be more like Christ? Well, that's what we want to look at this morning. So if you have a Bible, please turn with me to the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 28. We've been studying this book the past few months and We've almost made it to the end. As I said last Sunday, Exodus 25 through 31 are the instructions for building the tabernacle, the requirements for the priests. Uh, Exodus 36 through 44 is the construction of the tabernacle. So last week we looked at the tabernacle. Today we're looking at the function of the priests. Uh, And next Sunday will be the last part of the Exodus series. We'll look at when Israel worshiped the golden calf. So look at me at Exodus chapter 28. Uh, beginning in verse 1. It says, Then bring, bring near to you Aaron your brother, his sons with him, from among the people of Israel, to serve me as priests. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nabab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother, for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with the spirit of skill, that they, make, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. So right there in the middle of God's instructions for building the tabernacle, God gives specific instructions regarding Aaron, who is Moses' brother, and Aaron's sons. And Aaron and all of the other priests would, would, uh, who would follow him later were from the tribe of Levi. We know there were the 12 tribes of Israel, and one tribe, the Levites, were set apart to serve the Lord on behalf of God's people. So did the Levites earn that big responsibility? Did they somehow sin less than the other 11 tribes? No, they were set apart because God chose them. It was God's grace that they were set apart for the work of the Lord. 
And it continues to work in this way today. God isn't looking for religious supermen or religious superwomen to accomplish his purposes. Actually, God goes a step further, right? First Corinthians 1, God uses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. It's by God's grace and his grace alone we can be used as his instruments. And in verse 1, we read the main responsibility of the priests of the tribe of Israel. To serve God. Now, of course, they had a responsibility to minister to the people, but this was secondary to the main thing, and that was serving and ministering to the Lord. Right? Jesus told us this, too. He said the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. That's number one. The second thing, the second greatest, was to love our neighbor as ourselves. Right? So all ministry to God should flow out of a love for God and out of service to God. Right? Seek, the kingdom, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else shall be added to you. You know, sometimes we can get lost in ministry when we get this order wrong. When we spend all of our time serving other people, but we never take the time to stop, to pray, and to spend time with the Lord. That's when we have to stop what we're doing and return to the Lord. God cares more about you than what you can do for him. Don't get me wrong, God made us, right, to minister to others. But as Jesus said, that's always number two. The first thing is to love God and to serve him, just like the priests of Levi long ago. Verse two says that the holy uh, clothing needs to be made for Aaron, for the priests. And the rest of chapter 28 is a description of that clothing. We have a picture of the the clothing that chapter uh, 28 describes for us. Uh, Here, you can see it up here. So there were specifications for the the priest's uh, breastplate, the turban, the white inner robe, the blue outer robe. You can't see it in this picture, but there were even specifications made for the priest's underwear. So what's significant about all of this clothing? Why a whole chapter devoted to clothing? Well, as one author says, God provided these garments for at least three reasons. The first one, they gave the priests dignity and honor and set them apart in the same way a uniform would identify a soldier or a, nor- a nurse or someone else, right? The, the nation of Israel could recognize who the priests were by their clothing. The gold, the blue, and the purple colors matched the, the colors of the tabernacle. Secondly, they revealed spiritual truths related to their ministry. The clothes revealed spiritual truths related to their ministry. So the breastplate was was the breastplate of decision, and it symbolized the fact that the priests represented Israel before God. On that robe were 12 stones, 12 jewels, which represented the 12 tribes of Israel that God used the priests to speak to. And so in it, we see this two-way street. The priests represented the people to God, and God used uh, the priests to minister to his people. Third thing we see in chapter 28, if the priests didn't wear the special garments, they might die, it says, right? In the description, we find that there were even gold bells attached to the robe that would make noise whenever the priest would, would enter the tabernacle for his own protection, and you're like, okay, I can, I, can get all, I can understand all of those functions. But what about the underwear? What function could the underwear possibly serve? But even in the underwear, <laughs> we uh, uh, understand a bit of theology. Remember, uh, when sin entered the world, before sin, er, sin entered the world, Adam and Eve, they walked through the Garden of Eden naked, without sin, and without shame. But that changed when they sinned, right? Suddenly they realized their nakedness and they went and and they hid. They needed covering because of their sin. And in the same way, the priests were covered by these underwear garments. So the clothes didn't reflect the character of the priest, like let's say Aaron. The clothing, rather, just like the tabernacle, 
represented the holiness and otherness of God. So chapter 28 is all about the clothing, and chapter 29 is all about the consecration of the priests. Look at verse 1 in chapter 29. Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. Take one bull of the herd and two rams without blemish. And it goes on and on. To consecrate something means to separate it from things that are unclean, to distance itself from things that would uh, contaminate, let's say, a relationship with a perfect and holy God. And the rest of chapter 29, we read the steps for the priests to be consecrated back then. First, the priests had to, to wash themselves. Then their turban was, was anointed with oil. Then there was a sacrifice of, of a bull as a sin offering. Then a ram was sacrificed as a food offering. Then parts of a, a ram and bread were used as a wave offering. Then there was also a peace offering. Then there was a sacrifice on the altar of a young lamb. And there were even more requirements as part of this consecration process. And it's easy to read chapter 29. It's easy to read all of these steps and be confused and just say, what's What's going on with all this? What's the, the point of all this? Why was all of this necessary? Well, the fact is, while the priests of the tribe of Levi were set apart to serve God, there was still one huge problem with them. The priests were human. <laughs> and since they were human, that meant that they still sinned. As we said last week, when we read about the tabernacle, it was easy to see the, the holiness of God, that God is set apart, that God can't have anything to do with sin. And so all of these steps from the clothing of chapter 28, uh, all of the sacrifices and preparations we read here in chapter 29 are trying to make the priests as, let's say, clean and presentable as possible. All of those animal sacrifices were there to deal with the priests' sins and the sins of the people. So what is the main message of this? The main message we read is that sin must be dealt with before we can enter the presence of a holy God, that we must be made clean before we into, enter into the presence of our Lord. This is summarized at the end of Exodus chapter 29, uh, verses 44 through 46. It says, I will consecrate the tent of meeting in the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord, their God. That was the point of all of this, that God might dwell among them. The heart of all these consecration steps was so that God could dwell among them, so that he could be their God, so that they would know he is their God, the God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, so that God could dwell among them. So that was it. That was the system of the tabernacle. That was the system of the priests. This is what we call the old covenant. So what was the problem with the old covenant? Why do we need a new covenant? Well, I wouldn't say that there was a problem with the old covenant because this is, the, this is what God gave to Israel. So there wasn't necessary, necessarily a problem, let's say. But we know from the New Testament that God had a better sister system coming. And the book of Hebrews is very helpful in understanding the relationship between the old covenant and the new covenant. So look at me in the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 9, beginning in verse uh, uh, 6. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 6 through 10. It says, These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their rit ritual duties. But into the second, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy place, places is not yet open 
as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink, various washings, regulations for the body, and pose until the time of reformation. As we said last week, when we looked at the tabernacle, inside the the tabernacle, there was a curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. So all priests could go in the holy place, but only the high priest could go into that second section, the holy of holies. And even at that, the the high priest could only go there once a year on the day of atonement. And there he would make a sacrifice for the sins of the people on the Ark of the Covenant. But what does the book of Hebrews say was incomplete about this system? Verses 9 and 10 said that all of these gifts, all of these sacrifices, all of these washings, all of these regulations, all this food, all of this drink involved, all of these things could not perfect the conscience of the worshiper. And that leads me to my first observation from the text, and that is the outside doesn't change the inside. The outside doesn't change the inside. What does that mean? It means that while all of these external things were happening, the gifts, the sacrifices, the washings, the regulations, the food and drink, while all of these outside external things were happening, it wasn't bringing spiritual healing on the inside, in the conscience, in the heart, in the soul of the people. In other words, you could do all of these things on the outside, but it wasn't fixing what was broken on the inside. Therefore, the outside looked good, but the inside wasn't changed. And it wasn't because the priests or the people weren't trying. (laughs) It wasn't because of their lack of effort. The problem was all of these outside external things weren't solving the problem going on in their souls. The outside wasn't changing the inside. That was the limitation of the old system. Now, I call this the old system, but perhaps it's not an old system for you. Maybe you're still stuck in this trap of trying to do external things, outside things, to make yourself right with God. Maybe you're still trying to do these outside things to pay for your sins. Maybe you think God will accept you if you give the church money. Maybe you think God will accept you because you come to church every Sunday. Maybe you think God will accept you because of this action or that action. Don't get me wrong, those actions aren't bad. Those actions are good. But they don't work in terms of salvation and for paying for your sins. This is what it's saying in Hebrews 9. The outside doesn't fix the inside. It just doesn't. So what then? What's the way out? Well, keep looking at Hebrews chapter 9 with me, verse 11. It says, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, He entered for once and for all into the holy places, not by means of blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Verse 11 begins with, but when Christ. Anytime a verse in the New Testament begins with, but now, or but with Christ, you know it's going to be good news. But when Jesus Christ appeared as a high priest. Remember the function of the high priest in the tabernacle. He was the only one that could go into the Holy of Holies to bring the sacrifice which could atone for the sins of people. But remember that high priest, he was just a person capable of sin like you and me. But Jesus Christ comes as the greater high priest. Jesus, the Son of God, the Lamb who came away to take the sins of the world. The Word became flesh, and as we saw last week, and tabernacled among us, and dwelt among us. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and yet is without sin. Jesus is Emmanuel, God 
with us. He's able to understand our weaknesses. He, is, he was tempted like we were, but there's one big difference, Hebrews 4 says. He was without sin. He was sinless. So when Jesus Christ appears on earth as our high priest, he doesn't have that high priest clothing on. He doesn't have the term, turban. He doesn't have the blue ephod on. He doesn't have the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. He doesn't have any of those clothings on. Why? Why isn't he wearing the high priest clothing? Because he doesn't need it. He doesn't need to consecrate himself because he is already consecrated. He is already holy. He is without sin. He doesn't need to cover up his sin because he is without sin. He is clothed, but the Bible says he is clothed with the righteousness of God. He's the greater high priest. And where does it go? Let's read verses 11 through 12 again in chapter 9. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of the goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. So Jesus didn't go into the earthly tabernacle or the tent that was made in human hands. Instead, he went directly into the presence of God in heaven, into the holy places. And how many times did Jesus go there? Once a year? The way the high priest typically did? No, Hebrews says he entered there once and for all. That leads me to my second point this morning, and and that is Jesus went into the holy of holies once and for all. What does that mean? We get more detail from other places in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 7, verses 26 through 27, it says, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, Holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then those for the people, since he did this once and for all when he offered himself up. Because Jesus was without sin, there was no need for him to offer a daily sacrifice like the high priests. No, his sacrifice was once and for all. Chapter 10, verses 11 through 12. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. Back then, the priests had to offer sacrifices every day because the sins kept coming. The sins kept needing to be atoned for. A new day meant new sacrifices. But Jesus offered a single sacrifice for sin. He paid for them all uh, on the cross, was raised, and now sits at the right hand of the Father. Sitting down at the right hand of God uh, shows the completion of Jesus' work, that it's finished, that we can't add to it, that we can't take away from it. It is done once and for all. So let me ask you a question this morning. Which of your sins did Jesus die for? Your past sins, your present sins, or your future sins? Answer, (laughs) all of them. He paid it all, once and for all. So let me ask you this morning, are you trying to pay for something that Jesus has already bought? You know, there's an old book I read in high school called uh, The Things They Carry. And it was about different men uh, at war. And each chapter would look at a different soldier and would talk about the things that they carried in their pockets. So one soldier carried extra food with them. Another soldier carried uh, a journal with them. Another soldier carried a hunting tool. Another soldier carried a picture of his, his girlfriend. But as you read the, the book, as you read the story, you realize that the book is not really about the physical things these soldiers were carrying. It's not really about the extra food or the journal, the hunting tool, or the picture of the girlfriend. Instead, the book is really about the emotional things that the soldier carried. Their fears, their doubts, their regrets. 
And you realize that those things, those intangible things that you can't hold in your hand, were actually heavier for the soldiers to carry than whatever they had in those pockets. Those regrets, those sins weighed more on them than anything you could find in their pockets. Let me ask you this morning, what are you carrying today? What has been weighing you down? Is there some sin that you are still trying to pay for and atone for? Let me ask you this morning, did Jesus die on the cross for that sin too? Did Jesus pay for that sin too? Is that part of once and for all? As I always say, I think it's somewhat easy to believe that Jesus died for 99.9% of your sin. But where there is new life, where there is transformation, when you finally understand the beauty and power of the cross is when you believe that Jesus died for that 0.01 sin too. That terrible mistake you made a long time ago. That sin that you can't forgive yourself for. Do you believe that Jesus died for that too? Don't spend your life trying to pay for something that Jesus already bought for you. Let's go back to chapter 9, verses 13 through 14. It says, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? It says, When you believe in Jesus, when you believe in his blood, his perfect sacrifice covers you. And what does verse 14 say that it actually does? It says that all of that outside stuff looked good. Remember what it said earlier. But it couldn't fix what is inside. It couldn't solve the problem of sin. But now, through Christ, instead of being a slave to sin, you be can become a slave to righteousness. When we believe in Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit and then what can we do? As it says in verse 14, we can serve the living God just like the priest did in the old covenant. My last point this morning is simply that now we serve God from the inside out. Now we serve God from the inside out, not from the outside in. You know, as I look around today, I see a lot of beautiful and handsome people and y'all look good. You did your hair today. You did your makeup today. You put on your, your freshest clothes. You look great. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's fantastic. But the Bible says that God cares more about what's going on inside of you. He cares most about what's going on in your heart. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at your heart. So you might look good to all of us, you know, out here. You might look put together and, and fresh. But perhaps your heart is a total mess. There's an old song that says, the prettiest people can do the ugliest things. And no matter how good you look on the outside, that won't change what's inside. Jesus Christ came to save you. He came to forgive you of your sins, but he also comes to grow you, to, to give you the abundant life that he offers in him. So in Exodus 29, we read about this process of consecration that was making the priests holy and acceptable through their clothing and through sacrifices and through washing. This made them presentable to God and gave them the ability to serve God in the tabernacle. But in the New Testament, we read about the process of sanctification, the process of making believers holy and mature. Now, consecration and sanctification are, seem pretty closely related, and they, and they are, but I think there's a big difference. Consecration was an external uh, human act. It was on the outside. Put on these clothes, make these sacrifices, wash your hands. But sanctification is an internal, divine act of God. 
Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, sanctify them by your truth, O Lord. We looked at uh, Wednesday night at Bible study that we are still called, no matter how old you are, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. It's becoming more mature in Christ. It's bearing more fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's trusting that Jesus, who began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion, that we would grow in our holiness through the Holy Spirit. Again, from the inside out. So that we wouldn't go through the motions God to, with God. So that we wouldn't be like children and just say, sorry, to God. Without any genuine repentance, without our hearts breaking. But by the Holy Spirit's power that we would be moved to genuine repentance when we sin. That the things that breaks God's heart would break our hearts as well. We saw last week that the deeper the priest went into the tabernacle, let's say the more scary and frightening it was because of the holiness of God. And we see that even in the Old Testament, that if someone even touched the Ark of the Covenant, they died. The holiness of God was a terrifying thing. But Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that because of Christ's once and for all sacrifice, that we don't have to be afraid anymore. On the contrary, we can actually be confident. Chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that is opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great uh, priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised us is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one up and uh, stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as the day, as you see the day drawing near. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, through faith in him, we don't have to be fearful. We don't have to be frightened. We don't have to be afraid. We can be, it says in Hebrews 10, confident. We can approach the throne of, of God in confidence because our hearts are clean. We can hold fast to our hope in him. And from there, God sends us out to stir up one another to love, to do the good works which God has prepared in advance for you to do, to meet together like we're doing today, encouraging one another with the message uh, that we take to a lost world. In other words, once the inside has changed, we can be sent out. We can change the world from the inside out. Last week, as we looked at the tabernacle, we talked about the fact that now you and I are the tabernacle. God dwells in you. People can experience a God through you. And in the same way, the Bible says that you are his priests. First Peter chapter 2 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. You know, we still have a high priest today, and Jesus. He is the mediator between God and men. He is our high priest. But the Bible says, now you're the priests. We are the royal priesthood. You represent God to people who don't know him, yet you get to proclaim God's goodness to others. And the great thing is, it doesn't matter what you wear. You don't need the blue ephod. You don't need the white robe. You don't need the 12 stones. It doesn't matter what you wear physically because spiritually you are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You don't need to be consecrated because through Jesus Christ you are justified and are being sanctified. You're becoming more like him. As I said last week, when we read the Old Testament, it can be easy to skip over the instructions for the tabernacle or the requirements of the priests, or the details of the law. But I believe understanding these things can give you a more rich and deeper understanding 
of who you are in Christ. And when you know who you are, then you know what to do. So go. Be the tabernacle at your work. Go. Be the priest at your school. The system of the tabernacle and the priest from the Old Testament, they have been retired, but God has given us a more excellent way. Now people can meet the living God through you, Christ in you, the hope of glory coming from the inside and going out. I'm going to ask the worship team to, to come forward uh, to lead us in the song of, of response. And in a moment, we're going to have a time of uh, invitation. And it's a time for you uh, uh, to come out of your seat, to come forward, to, to tell someone what God's doing in your heart. There's something about telling someone with words, with what God's doing in your heart that is powerful. So this morning, if God is, is dealing with you, we want to help you. And this time is an opportunity for you to come forward and to respond what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. You know, maybe this morning you're realizing that you've been trying to serve God from the outside in. You've been trying to be good enough for God to accept you. But now you realize that's not possible. The only change can come from the inside. If this morning God is moving you to turn from your sins and trust Jesus Christ as Savior, I invite you to come forward. Or perhaps God is leading you to repent of certain sin in your life. Maybe this morning you look really good on the outside, but on the inside you know your heart is a mess. If God is leading you to repentance, I would love to pray for you. I'll be here in the front uh, as you come. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the reminder of, of who we are in you, God. We thank you for the new covenant that we have Jesus as our high priest who has dealt with our sin once and for all. Father God, we confess that many times we can forget that, we can try to carry our own sin, we can try to carry our own um, guilt, when the truth is that that has been paid for a long time ago. God, let us not be people frightened and afraid of you, but as it says in Hebrews, Hebrews 10, let us walk confidently, knowing that you are for us and with us. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.